Hello and welcome to this next video on the topic of vine copulas. Now, what I'm going to look at today is uh, conditional density and conditional copulas. Um, this is the first of the more mathematical aspects of vine copulas, and I'll try to break this broad topic down into a few bite-sized chunks because it can get quite involved. But one of the most important parts is to understand um, how we get to some of these conditional functions, uh, starting with conditional density and then on to conditional copulas, because once we understand these building blocks, we can move to increasingly complex vine copulas and be confident that we can actually um, calculate likelihoods, assess the fit, determine parameters and, and everything else which we'd need to do. So why might we want to look at conditional density? Well, the easiest way to understand this is to look at a very simple vine copula that we've already talked about a little, which starts with x3 in the middle and joins that to both x1 and x2. So we've got f of x1, f of x2, both joined to f of x3, and they're joined by copula. So c of f of x1, f of x3, and c f of x2 f of x3. Now when we're building a vine copula what we're doing is we're specifying those two pair copulas but even though that's the pair of, co the pair, of pair copulas that we're specifying it does imply, the structure does imply a relationship between f of x1 and f of x2 even if we haven't explicitly said what that relationship is at the outset we haven't explicitly defined it. We still need to allow for it though if we are looking at the overall likelihood of this structure because what we ultimately want to do is to come up with not just a structure which is the most likely but a set of parameters which is the most likely and this leads us to maximum likelihood estimation. Now maximum likelihood estimation is um, a way of finding the parameters for a probability distribution, whether it's a univariate or a multivariate probability distribution, which means that the observations that we see um, are the ones that um, are maximized by the choice of parameters that we have. So that, that's what maximum likelihood estimation is trying to do. It's, it's trying to give us the parameters which mean that what we see is the most likely outcome um, for, for the parameters that we have, or, or rather the parameters mean that the distribution that we're using uh, means the observation we have are the ones that we'd be most likely to see. Having said that, if you're doing maximum likelihood estimation or you're coming up with a likelihood function, that likelihood function can be used to help check the fit of uh, a distribution can be used to compare parameter fits, can be used to compare structures, even if you're not using maximum likelihood estimation. So that likelihood function is itself really useful. You can use it for things like likelihood ratio tests, um, Akaiki information criterion, the AIC, Bayesian information criterion, to look at um, whether what you come up with is, is the best fit, the best structure, the best parameters. So if we're doing maximum likelihood estimation, or we're just coming up with a likelihood function, what we're starting with is a probability density function. So say we've got n variables or uh, that we're looking at, n, n sets of observations. We've got, uh, so we have f of x1, x2, all the way up to xn. And say that we are looking at this set of variables at um, time t, where t could be one, two, all the way up to capital T. That means that at time t, our probability density function is f of x1 t, x2 t, all the way up to xn t. And if we want to try and find the set of parameters that maximizes the likelihood given the observations that we've got for each of those variables over each of those time periods, what we want to do is we want to uh, calculate the probability density at time t for f of x1, x2, all the way up to xn. And we want to do that for each of t equals 1, t equals 2, up to t equals capital T. We then want to multiply all of these densities together. So we'd have 
uh, fx11, fx21, or let's say fxn1, multiplied by fx12, fx22, fxn2, all the way up to um, t equals capital T. And if we multiply those together, that gives us our likelihood function. And what we want to do is we want to try and find the parameters for the distribution that we've chosen that maximize L, that maximize that likelihood function. Now, in practice, we tend to use the log of the likelihood function because that turns this product into a sum. And if we're trying to maximize something, uh, a sum of these different terms is far easier to work with than a product. And we can take the log because a likelihood function is always going to be positive because we're looking at probabilities, they're always positive. Um, and it's also a monotonic transform. So if we find something which maximizes the log of the likelihood function, then it will also maximize the likelihood function itself. So what's the relevance of this to conditional density? So say we're looking at three dimensions. And we've got a likelihood function is equal to the product over all those time horizons of f of x1 t, x2 t, x3 t. So what this means is we're interested in f of x1, x2, x3. But if we want to evaluate this um, probability density function, we've got to break it down into something which we can actually work with. And what we need to break it down into is univariate marginal density functions and some tractable copula density functions. We can then find the likelihood function and optimize. Now, even this can be tricky if we're looking at a large number of parameters. And there's a couple of compromises that can make estimation more manageable. Now, and I should say, in the examples that I'm going to be working with, we won't need to use these necessarily, but they are worth bearing in mind if we do find ourselves in a situation with, with a more comp complex uh, structure. So the first stage is something called the inference functions, or the first approach is a two-stage process called the inference functions for margins, or IFM method. And for this, what we do is we first fit the marginal distributions. We then take the parameters from that marginal distribution fit, and we take them as fixed. So when we're doing maximum likelihood estimation for the whole multivariate distribution, the marginal parts are taken as fixed, and the only moving parts are the bits which actually fit the copula. The second approach works well if we're just fitting the copula itself. So this means that we are um, implicitly taking the marginal distributions of, as fixed, but and we are just working with a copula. So this is called canonical maximum likelihood estimation. And the way that this works is we work with the distribution functions themselves. So we essentially disregard the marginal data, the shape of the marginal distributions, and we just assume that our, our inputs are simply distribution functions. So we're removing ourselves from a direct link to the underlying data. And you might think that if we're working with copulas, this is what we're going to be doing anyway, because everything we're talking about is in terms of our inputs being these uniform distributions. And that is true for most of the examples that we look at. But um, a good example might be, say you've got some marginal distributions for your data and you try to fit them with, say, an Archimedean copula or even a, a T copula. And say you want to compare this with just using a multivariate Gaussian distribution where um, your copula and your marginal distributions are inextricably linked. Um, in this case, using canonical maximum likelihood would be a very definite and quite questionable move if you look at a multivariate distribution. It would work fine when you, you've already, by definition, separated your marginal distributions in your copula, like you would if you're using an Archimedean copula, but it wouldn't be so sensible if you're using um, a multivariate distribution such as the multivariate normal distribution where the copula itself is, is implicit to what you're doing. So when we're looking at this approach um, of conditionality, it's easiest to just look at what's going on with two variables. And, and the remainder of this video is going to be looking at the two variable case because this gives us the building blocks which can then um, increase up to three variables up to any complex type of arvine that we might end up looking at.
So the focus here is going to be on this core building block, the two variable approach. Now, the starting point is distribution functions, f of x1 and f of x2. What we need to do if we're using uh, a, a likelihood function is to work with density functions. So we need to get to little f of x1 and little f of x2. Now, I can either find these by differentiation because little f of x1 is the partial derivative of the distribution function with respect to x1, or simply by definition, if the distribution function is itself just an integral of a density function, such as Gaussian or student's t. We can then define f of x1, x2 as f of x1 given x2 multiplied by f of x2, or f of x2 given x1 multiplied by f of x1. What this means is, if we rearrange this, it means that f of x1 given x2 is equal to f of x1 x2 over f of x2. Now we can use a similar approach for copulas because what we're often starting with with a copula is a copula distribution function, so c of f of x1 f of x2. And what we need to work with is a copula density function, little c of f of x1 f of x2. Now the first thing I'm going to do is redefine f of x1 and f of x2 as what they are, uniform distributions, u1, u2, because it's a bit of a mouthful talking about too many um, f of x's uh, within copulas and all the rest of it. So from now on it's going to be u1, u2. And we can then define our copula density function, c of u1, u2, as the uh, derivative of the copula distribution function, capital C of u1, u2, by u1 and u2. Now, copula density functions are often quite involved. Here's some Archimedean ones. As you can see, the Gumball one, the first term is actually a distribution function, the copula distribution function. So, you know, these are not simple functions that we have to work with. Frank and Clayton are a little bit more tractable, but, you know, there's still quite a lot of uh, letters in there. I've also included here uh, the independence copula, which is the distribution function being uv, because the density function is just one. And as we'll see, if we make a simplifying assumption, which we can't always make, that the um, conditional uh, density, the conditional copulas are independence copulas, that can really simplify our workload. As I say, we can't always do it, but if we can, um, the fact that the uh, copula density function for the independence copula is one can make life an awful lot easier. For um, elliptical bivariate copula density functions, you can see the distribution function here. I've used a sort of simplified term, which is in terms of uh, capital phi or uh, t for the Gaussian and student's t distributions. The density functions are a little bit more involved. I mean, they should look familiar. The only slight complication here is that the input, if we're working in terms of u and v, so uniform distributions, needs to be turned into the, uh, the language or the shape of the copula that we're using. So, for example, in a Gaussian um, copula, we need to take our uniform distribution and apply an inverse normal function to it to turn it into a normally distributed variable. We need to do something similar for, for the t distribution. So, again, these get quite, um, quite lengthy, these, uh, these copula density functions. So, back to conditional density. We know that um, capital C of u1, u2 is equal to capital F of x1, x2. So, you know, both of these are essentially probability distribution functions. Now, that's useful because we also know that f of x1, uh, x2 is this derivative of capital F of x1, x2 by x1 and x2. And by doing a little bit of rearranging, we can show that f of x1, x2 is actually equal to c of u1, u2 multiplied by f of x1 and f of x2. And this is really useful because it um, converts our joint uh, density function into a copula density function and two marginal density functions, which is what we're really trying to do. And this also reflects the relationship between the two variables that we're looking at. So if you think back to the structure of copulas, we've got nodes, 
for 1 and 2, and then we've got an edge between them. And this is essentially saying that our nodes are the um, univariate distribution or density functions, and the edge between them is the copula, either distribution or density function. And this gets really helpful when we're looking at more complex vine structures, because what we've kind of got here is we've got our first tree between 1 and 2, and then below that we've got the edge that joins these two nodes. And if we extend this to have more nodes in, then when we're looking at the um, edges for our first tree, we can actually turn these themselves into a tree and look at the edges between those edges, which becomes really important when we're trying to work out um, what the whole range of conditional uh, distributions and densities is. So, we've got c of u1, u2 is equal to f of x1, x2 over f of x1, f of x2, just um, rearranging what we had before. We've also got f of x1 given x2 is f of x1, x2 over f of x2. So, with another bit of rearranging or substitution, we can say that f of x1 given x2 is equal to c of u1, u2 multiplied by f of x1. And as we'll see later, this is really key when it comes to evaluating uh, vine coplas and evaluating the, the probability densities and the likelihoods of these vine coplas. So let's leave it there for now, and next time we'll move on to some three-dimensional cases which uh, build on these building blocks that uh, we've established here to, to help us understand the likelihoods for three-dimensional vine coplas.